behalf of the University of York, where I am a lecturer. Um, and it's always a pleasure to come to uh, visit India and meet Indian students and faculty and learn a little bit more about such an important uh, region of the world, an important uh, emerging economy. Um, when it was suggested that I could come again to India this time, I proposed this topic to be the subject of um, a lecture, and I'm honored that Jindal accepted that offer and invited me here today. I shall begin by saying a little bit more about my university. I'm from the University of York, which is in the north of England, in the United Kingdom, where I work in the management school as a lecturer in political economy, which is my subject. My PhD doctoral studies were in political science. And political economy interests me because it is the interface between politics and economics. And if one wanted to explain it in very simple terms, I would say political economy is about the use and abuse of power in international relations. And this is what fundamentally interests me about political economy in the global context when we are all faced by significant challenges uh, relating to globalization, which, as uh, the generous introduction mentioned, is the subject of a book that I produced a few years ago called Europe, the State and Globalization. Okay, um, the short talk I want to give uh, contains at the beginning some history and then I'm going to speak about the uh, rise of Western power in the global economy followed by mention of emerging economies such as China and India in the context of rising instability and diverse threats which um, confront us. At the end of the talk, I will ask the question, are we seeing in the transfer of power from West to East, a changing world order. So, the history that I give is recent. I'm speaking about the period after the Second World War, when following the devastation and the loss of over 60 million lives, in that conflict, the Allies, as they were called, summoned a global conference in Bretton Woods in the United States and established at Bretton Woods, under the direction of a UK economist whom I'm sure you all know, Milton uh, J. J. M. Keynes established the framework for the post-World War order. Of course, no sooner had the Second World War ended and a new war began, the Cold War, symbolized very powerfully by the division of the German city of Berlin between East and West, and indeed a wall that passed from the 
Baltic Sea in the north to the Bosphorus in the south that Winston Churchill memorably described as the Iron Curtain. So this was a time of acute division in the global environment. Indeed, what we saw with the Cold War was the polarization between East and West. East in this context meaning the Soviet Union and West meaning the NATO allies under the jurisdiction or under the hegemony, the power of the United States. And this was an ideological conflict between communism and capitalism, sustained also by the beginnings of an institutional framework, which is very much what I want to describe in the beginning of this talk. So this economic framework in the West meant the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, which by 1995 became the World Trade Organization, and in Western Europe, the European Economic Community, which in 1992 became the European Union of today. In terms of defense, the orientation in the West was around NATO, and in the East, under the control of the Soviet Union and Moscow, the Warsaw Pact. Other leading institutions established at the same time, of course, the OEEC, the OECD, and also the United Nations. This framework certainly achieved a level of stability albeit a stability under the shadow of potential nuclear conflict. The stability, however, did enable the rise of Western economic power in what Kenichi Omai in 1985 described as the triad, a triangular marketing business commercial relationship between the United States, Western Europe, and Japan. And indeed, by 1985, there was a considerable, considerable emphasis on the role of multinational corporations from these three areas of the world, Japan, the United States, and Western Europe, really dominating the global economy. You could say that this was the high point of Western power just before the collapse of the Soviet Union. Of course, not to forget that India experienced a different trajectory following independence in 1947. India became the founder and principal architect of the non-aligned movement. Under Nehru, this country constructed a form of economic socialism that actually put India in a position of a stronger economic relationship with the Soviet Union in terms of financial assistance, but in terms of the political ideological positioning of India, India sought a middle path between East and West. India certainly achieved in this uh, period between 60 and 1990 a reasonable and consistent growth level of around 4%. But India was overwhelmed, as was much of the uh, Western economy also, by the Gulf oil shock of 1992 and experienced very high levels of inflation and 
a significant depression in terms of economic growth. So India's response was to begin a package of structural reforms which enabled India to enter a period of rapid development, reaching annual growth levels of 9-10%. This has had a transformative effect on India, as you all know, and I am uh, increasingly aware on my various visits. Indeed, as a critic of globalization and everything that globalization has brought forward, it's clear that also globalization has brought benefits as more people are delivered from severe poverty into a position of relative material prosperity. And this has been the story in India. It's also been the story in China. So globalization and global commerce and trade has brought opportunities to India that until 1992 seemed far away. In China, of course, the switch has been even more dramatic, and I'll say a bit more about that. So I mentioned already this triad of uh, a market commercial relationship between the United States, Western Europe, and Japan. And of course, over a period of years, from the 1980s onwards, the triad expanded to include more countries. And the Asia-Pacific region, after 1992, experienced considerable development. ASEAN joined with China, or I should say China joined with ASEAN in 2010 and substantially built upon its previous uh, 20, 20 years of open trade to become the world's first, depending on how you measure it, the first or second largest economy. By now, we can ask, is the triad even relevant? Because the expansion of business opportunities and wealth generation in Asia has been such that China is a major player in the global economy, and many other countries have joined the party, particularly the so-called BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Korea, South Africa, all have joined into the expansion of global markets. However, there are changes happening in the way financial trade is conducted, particularly in the wake of the financial crisis that struck in 2008-9. And uh, in large measure, that crisis was averted by government intervention. But actually, in my view, the underlying reasons for that crisis have not gone away. And it's false, I think, to believe that financial crisis is something of the past, because capitalism has delivered repeated crises and the next one is always not so far away. That might sound fairly pessimistic. Maybe it is pessimistic, but the story tells us that capitalism delivers periodic crises. So for sure, there will be another. Now, part of my question in the title for this talk is, is this really a permanent shift of power from west to east. And one of the reasons why I'd be fairly skeptical about that is if we consider where wealth is located, wealth is still located very much in the northern hemisphere. The strongest markets are in the northern hemisphere 
and the strongest markets are still in the United States, in Europe, in Japan. And so, to a degree, one can see that the old order of the triad is still in existence. However, against that, it is quite clear also that in political economy terms, we are now witnessing a changed environment which is much more multipolar. In other words, what is happening in the global economy is that there is an orientation towards the BRICS economies that we did not have previously. And also, if we can speculate as to what may happen in the future, we see the beginnings of greater regional alignment. We see the possibility that ASEAN, already with China incorporated in uh, a free trade agreement, there is the possibility that ASEAN further develops with allegiances taking in other countries. So in the center of this picture, what I'm suggesting is possible emerging structures that may occur over the next 20 odd years. It's speculation. But the Shanghai Cooperation Organization is another forum which may develop a much stronger presence in political terms as well as in economic terms. We see India, Russia, and Brazil as part of the BRICS, but so far not really in an integrated structural framework in the way that ASEAN functions as uh, an intergovernmental organization. So ASEAN has some sort of potential to develop stronger economic ties within its members. But none of these possible linkages that I'm describing have the political integration that has occurred in Western Europe and indeed beyond Western Europe now in the European Union of 28 member states. And I'll come back to this picture later with, a, with, a, with another comment on it. The other thing that suggests that maybe this shift is happening from west to east is that we do see significant evidence for a decline in US power. Remember what I said a few moments ago that after the Second World War, the Bretton Woods framework was there to establish uh, a global stability in market relationships. But it was also there to establish the power of the United States as the primary contributor to the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund and the primary force in NATO. But actually this uh, has been conflicted, I think, by significant evidence of US decline. By US decline, we can point, for example, to the failure of the United States military to achieve US objectives in the Vietnam War, despite 10 years of trying. In fact, the extent of the disaster of the Vietnam War is only now, I think, being fully understood as historians uncover the realities, the truths behind that particular war. And it really was a humiliation for the United States. But it wasn't the only humiliation. It was the first of, effectively, I would say, a series of four humiliations. In Iraq in 2000, 2003, the United States removed Saddam Hussein, but in every other respect, its objectives were not fulfilled. In Afghanistan, too, the dysfunctionality of Afghanistan as a working state and the um, emergence of terrorist groups, some of whom the US itself had much to do with their origins of, shows that the US campaign in Afghanistan has also not been a success. 
The war in Syria, such a complete catastrophe for the people of Syria themselves, but also a military failure on the part of the United States, where President Putin of Russia has managed to uh, embarrass the United States by Russian intervention in support of the apparent enemy of the US, Assad and the Assad regime, to um, ensure effectively the Russian intervention has been decisive and has ensured that now, six years on, we are still contemplating a Syria with Assad in control. Not actually control, but certainly still president. So I identify Vietnam, Iraq, Afghanistan, and Syria, and the war against ISIS, or Daesh, as being significant military failures on the part of the US. The election of Donald Trump has given rise to a rather alarming shift in US policy, away from supporting international institutions that the US has been instrumental in establishing, towards what Trump calls an America first policy. So there is a, a danger here that um, Trump leads to a form of protectionism of US business interests that would run quite counter to the idea of open and free trade. You'll notice that I use the term trumpery. I haven't read or seen that term used anywhere. I use it myself because if people speak about Trumpism, it seems to me to imbue Trump and his ideology, if we, one can call it that, with a, a, a kind of seriousness that I don't recognize. And when Trump communicates with the world by Twitter, often in a way which is frankly embarrassing um, also to US citizens, or many of them, it seems to me that we're living through some kind of bad joke where uh, the US presidency is concerned. So I, I call it trumpery. The rise of the BRICS is also a significant threat to US control or US hegemony. And among the BRICS, of course, the, the, the most powerful is China. And China is significantly impacting on the tendency for emerging economies to look to the United States. After the Second World War, emerging economies through the World Bank, through the International Monetary Fund, felt the kind of aura of Western institutions. This is changing with the advent of the Asian Infrastructure and Investment Bank created by China, inviting many other nations, including the UK and Germany, to join in with this new framework for uh, supporting investment projects. So, I think the advent of new institutions that are bigger, broader, more oriented towards emerging economies is a threat to the United States. And we see that in the G20 becoming a more significant global institution than the G7. We see it in the Asian Inter in Investment Bank and in China's um, positioning effectively as uh, the largest member of ASEAN. We also see the failure of US created institutions. The permanent five in the UN is dysfunctional because they rarely share the same perspective on big issues. And the use of veto, either by Russia 
or by China or by the United States has an extremely limiting impact on the effectiveness of NATO, uh, of, sorry, UN resolutions. And the UN Security Council, with 12 members, seven of them rotating, finds itself equally handicapped by the opportunities for P5 members to veto UN resolutions. So the UN itself becomes relatively dysfunctional, unable to really respond to major crises that are affecting humanity in the 21st century and affect significant regions like the fallout from the Arab Spring in 2010, 2011. What we see is considerable chaos in the North African and Middle Eastern region. The failure, too, to resolve the Israel-Palestine conflict. So the UN is not working. Also, finally, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty is not working and has not worked because since the Non-Proliferation Treaty was established, uh, Pakistan, Israel, and potentially even North Korea have become nuclear powers. So the control of nuclear power as a military instrument is also under significant threat. There is also a further sign of US decline in the instability in the traditional preferred institutions of the United Nations of the United States, instability in the European Union, instability in uh, the G8, instability in NATO, given the very poor relations, for example, between Turkey and other member states of NATO. The role of the G8 has diminished as the role of the G20, a broader organization, has uh, increased, leading to a situation of more dispersed power, rather than power being essentially located around the United States and the Washington consensus, we see power much more dispersed. So that's my thesis, which says that actually, yes, we do see US decline. Arguably, the high point of US power was the end of the Soviet Union. When Francis Fukuyama wrote his famous uh, pamphlet, The End of History and the Last Man, at that time, the triumphalism of the West under the presidency of Ronald Reagan looks to have backfired. And since that time, the victory, if you like, of capitalism over communism we have had a series of additional crises with the growing militarism of Russia, the, the fomenting the crisis in Ukraine about which the United States has been able to do very little. NATO itself found uh, it, it, it was uh, unable to um, prevent the annexation of Crimea and as I've already mentioned, Putin's engagement with Syria on the side of the Assad regime is a further bad sign for uh, US power. China has emerged as a prominent adversary in Asia to US hegemony. And for many reasons, also internal reasons, one can be skeptical about the prospects of what used to be called the American dream. The new American dream, globalization, remains damaged, tarnished, and in some ways under threat, even by an American president who looks towards more protectionist uh, 
uh, uh, policy making in terms of trade. The optimism of the early 1990s or the end of the Cold War has been replaced by times of anxiety in the current global context. Anxiety concerning food and water insecurity affecting millions of people, also in India, also in China, particularly today we read in South Africa. Global poverty is still with us. Very many fewer people are in that earning less than $1 a day or less than $2 a day category. However, there are still probably somewhere around a billion people suffering water insecurity on a daily basis. Inequality has become actually even more extreme under contemporary economic globalization. Climate change becomes a major challenge and a stimulus together with war for what Ai Weiwei, the Chinese artist, probably the most famous Chinese uh, um, on the planet, Ba Xi Jinping, the president. Ai Weiwei has made a film called Human Flow about the world's 65 million refugees, the latest that we know about, the Rohingya uh, exiled many into Bangladesh by the government of Myanmar. So the picture that you can see, the image may not be too clear, but it is the Nizip refugee camp in Turkey, which houses refugees from the Syrian war. And I've mentioned too climate change which is equally a severe challenge. And the two are very connected because climate change is going to be the great driver of migration and further refugee crises over the next 10, 20, perhaps 30 years. And I'm not sure that we really have a plan, certainly not in the richer northern countries, of Western Europe and of North America. I don't think we have a plan for how to deal with this coming crisis. The world is changing and this is a similar picture to the one I already showed you. But it's slightly different in that what I'm trying to indicate here is the potential for alignment in the eastern side of the Eurasian landmass that can bring together ASEAN members, the largest of which is Indonesia and China, into a more coherent group under Chinese hegemony, under Chinese power, economic and political. And a significant, uh, somewhat parochial alteration to the picture of the European Union is that the, Europe, the United Kingdom, the country where I come from, seems intent on separating itself from the European Union, which, given the nature of the picture, is a kind of surprising thing to do. Because in a multipolar world, large blocks or large countries become the major players. So large blocks like the USA, China, ASEAN, potentially the Shanghai Corporation Organization or the African Union, and large countries with tremendous economic potential like India or Brazil perhaps also Russia, 
Japan is still a major global economy. So what is the UK? It's a small, it's at very most a medium-sized country. And its act of separation from the European Union has been described by many who oppose that separation as an act of self-harm. So now, in response to all that is happening, I ask a question. And it is, how to make the world a better place? And that's a question that requires imagination, ambition, creativity, ideas, And it also requires your participation. So I'm going to ask you to give me three or four minutes during which you talk to each other and answer that question, and then you tell me what you think is the answer. Or answers. There isn't one answer. There's many answers. So... I would like to stop talking for three or four minutes while you talk to each other and answer that question, then give me your suggestions. Okay? What do you mean by a better place? How do you define that better place? To make the world more secure for people who live in it. To, to reduce anxiety. If we consider the statistics, the very objective parameters to identify, it might be the case that we are living in the best possible version of the world. It's the least violent, least anxiety prone, and one of the best uh, living standards from all those perspectives. So this might be the best place but could it be better? My God, the whole perspective we are talking about is mostly the Western or the American way of defining better. It might not be the even the unipolar or the multipolar world which you are talking about is more or less a Western way of defining the history. When Trump says that America first, he is the first one to say that. But China first was there 20 years before. The whole concept of not opening their currency to the market or even the restrictions and current restrictions sure. on FII and FDI okay. is basically China first. Okay, so if, if America first for you is a problem and a historical one, America has always put itself first and China first is also a problem, what is a better way? No, it's not a problem. You see, the way you define, that's what I'm saying, the philosophy <coughs> the concept of seeing things the way they are right now wrong, and then there could be a better thing. But you don't might agree be, with uh, that? Confusing philosophy in itself. Oh, it might be, yes. I think the world is a confusing place. But I don't think that means that, well, there are two things. If you ask the question, you maybe are implying there are big problems with the world. But you, you seem not to agree with that. See, the amount of violence for capital violence. Okay, is yes, 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 yes. That is true. Let's see what other colleagues think. I'm going to stay with the question, how could you make the world a better place? Even if you think the world is just fine today, personally, I don't think it is, but if you think it's just fine there still might be ways to make it better. So... Yeah, in addition to that, from whose perspective you are talking about? The question is how to make, a world, make the world a better place. Yeah. But from whose perspective? Because if you use the political economy paradigm itself, there are so many burdens to it. 
So many versions, yes? So from what point of view are we looking at? So can you clarify or explain the question itself? From whose perspective you are talking about the world to make the world a better place? Whether should I take the India's point of view or my point of view? It may or may not be aligned. It may, it, it may not be aligned, but then I think if you want to make the world a better place for India, it would probably be a better place for everyone. See, it, not necessary, it is not necessary. Right? Okay. If you are earning profit, it may happen at the loss of someone else. So it, may, it may happen like that, indeed. So, can I have some other suggestions? Yeah. Six of the top ten companies weapons are from the US, right? And if I think more of that, you say there's no war, then the world is a better place. But that might not be well for so many people, including the US as well, because war is good for them to an extent. They have the reason to put almost 1,000 military bases across the world yeah. to do what it's going to be. And some of that, if you talk for Chinese companies, you know the top 50. Almost all of them are Western companies, yeah. right? And they have places across as well. So again, it's a very subjective view on better place for who. Right? Okay, but my my better place is not taking I'm not taking a US perspective. I'm not taking a Western European perspective. My perspective, and maybe it comes back to your question, is trying to take a planetary perspective. What is better for not for India or for the United States or for the United Kingdom, but for everybody. See, the dark way it's providing basic amenities, deduction and conflict. Yes. Are they, uh, trade barriers and all these things? Yes. Obviously, that is so, a uniform distribution of wealth. Good. A, a better distribution of wealth. I like that. What else would be? Why is this well, all the resources. Why is this well, all the resources should be protected. Protect resources? No, no, open. Ah, uh, yeah, open resources. Open resources to who? To everyone. Why just well, be distributed evenly? Okay. Okay. More equitable distribution of resources. Yes. What else? Any other suggestions? Competitive markets. Don't you think we have competitive markets? We have protectionism? Okay. So, so. Yeah. Okay. Good. So, by corporations. Okay. Good. I agree. So, you're speaking really about regional monopolization that makes competition impossible. New entrance to markets. Yeah. Sure. The the pharmaceutical industry is a very good example. You mentioned the arms industry too. These are industries that are very skewed towards big players who 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 exploit their own interests. Any other suggestions? Yes, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that, that it, it requires a recognition of the existence of climate change. And so, if I go back a slide or two, when I'm speaking about um, 
making the world a better place, one way would be to do something about the threat of climate change or do something about the threat of war, which drives, in this case, the <coughs> migrant crisis affecting Turkey. The, those fleeing uh, Syria are fleeing war, not climate change. So I'm going to move on to... How to make the world a better place, I have a prepared already a slide with some suggestions which I think are not from a specific Indian perspective or UK perspective where I live and work or European perspective or US perspective, but from a global perspective. And the suggestions are that Industrial processes need to find ways to cut pollution, to have cleaner production processes and cleaner transportation, to stop globalisation from being simply the construction of a new form of colonisation, to maintain sustainable development, Sustainable development means providing for future generations, using resources in a way that does not damage the prospects of future generations. That requires a real and functioning corporate social responsibility, which our colleague from Ukraine has already alluded to, businesses do not practice. To make agriculture a free market, which you also mentioned, that one needs effective competition, not protectionism. Fair trade, I would argue, is m actually more important than fair free trade. So fair trade allows weaker emerging economies to protect their own resources. We need a better distribution of food, a better distribution of wealth. We need to increase security and reduce one of the scourges of the planet, which is high levels of corruption. And from a Western perspective, often, if you read the Economist Transparency Index, there's always an assumption that Western countries are less corrupt than everybody else. I actually don't believe that. I don't believe that. I think that corruption has many forms. And the kind of corruption that exists in sub-Saharan Africa is a different kind of corruption than exists in my country, the United Kingdom. And the impact of the corruption in the UK is far more serious and on a much bigger scale than the impact of corruption in a medium-sized sub-Saharan African country like Tanzania. So corruption I see as a universal human problem. It's not limited to poorer countries. Population is clearly a major threat, but more than population, I think within demographics, issues like women's education and gender equality and escaping from patriarchal structures is a much more important aim to benefit half of humanity. And if you benefit that half of humanity, my claim is you benefit all. <clears throat> there needs, I believe, to be a new standard of minimum human rights <coughs> to promote meaningful democracy and end slavery. 
because slavery did not end in 1832. Slavery is a current problem throughout the world, including in my home city of York. It's a universal problem connected to human trafficking, bondage, pornography, prostitution, forced labour, the removal of workers' rights, all creating forms of slavery which we are supposed to have abolished uh, in the early part of the 19th century. Again alluded to in what you said, the promotion of health care, especially in emerging economies, health care on which pharmaceutical corporations have a major responsibility. We need development without dependency. We need to end the practices of the arms trade, which our colleague here alluded to, that arms sales profit from war. War is the driver of various Western economies, including the United Kingdom, United States, and sadly, in the last 20 years, also Germany. 20 years ago, Germany didn't have an arms economy or an arms industry, but today it has a very significant arms industry. I think also an, an important uh, response to the question how to make the world a better place is to find ways to combat cybercrime. Not mentioned so far in this lecture, but cybercrime will be in the 21st century probably the most important, most significant way of waging war. Cybercrime is already a major threat, it's already a reality. But war in the future may be conducted by disabling state systems, such as healthcare. It doesn't need bombs. It doesn't need armies. Cybercrime can disable an economy in seconds. Some of these suggestions are interconnected. So I mentioned previously reducing world population. And the significant issue with world population is not just space, it's food security. But you could deal with food insecurity very simply by persuading Western high-consumption economies to reduce meat consumption. Because meat consumption uses fantastic quantities of water, fantastic quantities of land, to feed the Western diet. So, a major change, a simple change, would be to get rid of the classical Western diet of meat twice a day. We don't need it. Meat once a week or not at all would do a great deal for water security and food security and land security. We also need, I think, to reform global institutions, and in particular the United Nations is dysfunctional with five permanent members based on the victorious powers of the Second World War. So your colleagues at the back may, may not agree with the question, but I hope you might have some sympathy with the answers. <laughs> I ask, uh, what is the purpose of business, the business environment? What is business strategy about? And what is corporate social responsibility? And I argue that business responsibility is to accord with principles of social responsibility. Milton Friedman criticised businesses 
for having any social responsibility at all. In a Times Magazine article, Friedman argued that businesses' sole purpose is to generate profit for shareholders. He said companies that adopted responsible attitudes would face more constraints than companies that didn't, making them less competitive. So just to repeat, he said that businesses' sole responsibility is to generate profit for shareholders. I don't believe that. Corporate social responsibility requires protection for public goods. Public goods, food security, the environment, health, clean water, public space, transport infrastructure, housing, education and human rights. These are the responsibilities for all stakeholders and not simply shareholders. And businesses, of course, have many stakeholders. The stakeholders in a business are the owners, the employees, the staff, customers, banks, investors, government, suppliers, and the local community. Fortunately, good things do happen. China and India are at the forefront of efforts to combat climate change, even if climate change is denied by the President of the US. That picture, I think, is in Tamil Nadu is the biggest uh, solar plant in the world. So, to conclude, I come back to the question. The changing world order, is Western decline inevitable and will developing economies shape the 21st century and renewed institutionalism? In summary, I argue that Western decline is real. But it's not terminal and it's not dramatic. It's like a slow puncture. We see the rise of others, not necessarily the decline of the West, but the rise of others. We see new institutions emerging and we hope a new institutionalism that can contribute positively to global governance. There is no doubt the times they are changing. And Bob Dylan said that 50 years ago, and it's still true. Thank you very much. Don't know if you uh, have time, what your schedule is, but if there are questions, anybody want to argue against anything that I've said? Yeah? Uh, you said uh, the ideology of what kind of ideology is there? What kind of? Um, you uh, mentioned the Trumpism. Trumpism. What does it mean? Trumpism, according to Trump, is America first. It's a new assertiveness in how the US protects its own interests. But as uh, your colleague said, Previously, America has always put itself first. But Trump, perhaps witnessing American decline, has become more assertive 
about American interests. I don't think there's any economic coherence in what he is proposing. He cannot reinvent the United States of America as a major manufacturing domestic supplying economy. He's actually denying the nature of international trade. That international trade means goods are produced in one place and supply another market. That is the reality of how globalization has developed in the last 200 years. Trump denies that. So protectionism also historically has been disastrous. The protectionism of the 1930s brought fascism and militarism to Japan and to the United to um, uh, what, Germany, and gave us the Second World War. So I don't see any coherence or logic in what Trump is attempting to tell us. Another question? It's a really interesting question and I, I, you may have detected I have a very close interest in Ukraine. I have been to Ukraine, to Kiev, uh, only two years ago and um, I found it extremely interesting. What of the future for Ukraine? The ambition of Ukraine, certainly the majority of the western side of Ukraine, is a close approximation to the European Union. But the politics of the situation make that very difficult because Russia is determined to prevent that from happening. I see Russia as aggressive. I see Russia as dangerous to Eastern European interests and also to, to Ukraine. I see unfortunately not much space for optimism and Ukraine is challenged by many things. Another of these challenges is the immaturity of its own democracy and the risk of corruption undermining it. There should be channels for closer alignment with the European Union, but the cards are actually held by Moscow. That I find very worrying. So I don't have a clear answer. I don't really have a very positive answer. But we can hope that Russia does not want to risk more conflict over Ukraine. And hopefully the future will be better. Are you from Kiev? Yes. What a beautiful city. It's astoundingly beautiful. Really a wonderful place. Thank you. Any, any other questions? Okay, thank you. So I request Professor Hama to come and do the next please. Thank you. So uh, uh, coming here and uh, having this open lecture to all the students uh, on top of all the Jindal Global University and Jindal Global Business School, we want to thank you. And uh, uh, it's very useful and helpful. You have given us a global perspective of international economic policy, of integration, uh, and uh, for, uh, company social responsibility. Uh, and uh, we, uh, with our students, we have a lot of room to think about it, to discuss Thank during you. our lectures. And it's very uh, useful and helpful. And we, we are very glad uh, to see you next time. And, uh, Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you for your contribution to this university. Thank you. Okay.